Welcome everyone. Uh, it's technically Story Engine 101. I'm author Elizabeth Ann West here to uh, represent Pseudorite. We also have some awesome Pseudorite, Pseudorite uh, staff in the house with Josh Charles and Ryan Mather. However, tonight we're going to do a little bit of extra. We're going to go that next step beyond. So just consider this Pseudorite 101 dash um, sophomore level or something like that, because we're going to really talk about the nitty and gritty about these beats and how do we as authors and writers use this great technology, but make it right in our own voice. Okay, so without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. So here we go. I'm going to be, I'm signed into pseudo right, right here. Um, now, quick question is how do you even access Story Engine? Well, every single one of our projects and each one of these cards here is a project. You'll notice I named them very different things. But uh, here I have some prep for Story Engine 101 that I was playing with. Now, you do not have to come with your own outline to Story Engine, but um, I went ahead and prepped one just so that we would have one that had some extra layering to it. So let's pop into Story Engine, and it's right there on the left hand side. I'm going to, this top X in the top right here will take me right back to my project. So again, every single one of your projects has a Story Engine. So um, I'm going to actually come up here and I'm going to grab this um, synopsis that I that I have. Maybe not actually, let's go to story engine. We'll go to story engine. So brain dump is where we start and we can come up with a story. We can come up with any idea that we want to. So my actual <laughs> original idea was a um, give me an idea for a best selling fantasy romance uh, with the inspiration being celestial beings. This was actually my original prompt that I was using. Then I can tell it what genre I want, which is fantasy romance and the style, which is going to impact how it writes. Um, it's not really going to impact the other stuff earlier on. So most people would think like, I want to, I want to write just like XYZ author. But the better practice when you're working with AI is to not say X, Y, Z author, and here's why. You don't know what the AI actually knows about that author. If you take the time to interview uh, ChatGPT or anything like that and ask them some questions about some authors who are alive, you'll get some really wild answers out there. So the best practice is to actually describe the kind of writing that you love and that you want to write. So if I was writing fantasy romance, me, Elizabeth Ann West, um, let's see, I want snappy dialogue that's engaging to read, um, characters uh, characters that readers love, every word tied to emotional payoff, lots of romance. So you'll notice I'm literally describing the kinds of thoughts I have about my favorite books that I read. So how many of you, when you read books, you ever think to yourself, oh, I like this book because I liked the dialogue, or I liked this book because I liked the pacing. We all <laughs> analyze, right? We anal we've been analyzing literature since, you know, we could open a book open, we could crack a book open. So pull, dust off those, anal those analytical skills and use that to describe the style. Um, so fantasy romance and the brain dump is just give me an idea for a best-selling romance with the inspiration being celestial beings. If you hover over the question mark here, it's going to tell you how to use a box. It's also going to tell you what this box influences. So story engine works left to right. And as we fill in the boxes to the left, we're going to be able to make magic on the right. Trust me. So this, this section is going to affect synopsis and beats. And we'll get to that in just a second because we're going to synopsis now. So what is a synopsis? Um, so think about a synopsis. I don't want you to think about it as the back cover copy. That's actually not good enough. And as a matter of fact, most of the time, the AI will, will default to giving you what would be we would call a blurb or back cover copy. The right. best synopsis in Story Engine is actually going to reveal what your ending is. Think of it more as a narrative summary. Think of it as the kind of thing that you would send to a literary agent if you were trying to sell a book. Um, how many of you guys have ever heard about query letters and things like that? Yeah, 
Can you sell a book to an agent if you don't tell them what the ending is? No. No. <laughs> so think of it like that. Because if you don't have an ending on there, guess what the AI is going to invent? An okay. ending that may or may not work for your genre. So this is an advanced tactic. So make sure even with what it generates, I'm going to click generate right now. And the only information this thing has right now is that I'm doing celestial beings and everything like that. Um, so it came up with Lyra and Orion, and so you can see how it, it populated it very, very quickly. So the first thing that I would do is they must make a difficult choice that will determine the fate of their love in the celestial realm. They face off against the enforcers in a high stakes battle that will leave readers on the edge of the seat. The re resolution of the conflict is both heart wrenching and satisfying as Lyra and Orion's love proves to be stronger than any law or punishment. I have no idea why I, I read too early or too late rather. In a world where celestial beings roam the sky, a young woman named Lyra is, okay, yeah, let's not make her Lyra, let's make her Celeste. All right. She dreams of adventure and true love, but her mundane life as a seamstress in the small village of Elvendon, what, whatever, leaves much to be desired. On a fateful day while wandering in the forest, um, I'm actually going to not use this just to give you it as an example, because I already did the work on the previous one but I wanted to show you how it'll generate it for you. Now you could ask it to rewrite the whole thing um, and by giving feedback, please only use this box if you wanna make big sweeping changes that are gonna make a big difference. Don't use this box if you just wanna name change. Uh, for that one, we say, don't be a T-Rex. Don't forget that your voice can speak into the computer or that your hands can reach the keyboard. And the reason for that is because if I type in here and I click rewrite, it's gonna charge my account 400 and 400, 400 words again. And if I only wanted to change 12 words, that seems like bad math to me. What do you all think? Yeah. Yeah, so minor changes, change them yourself. If you really don't like it and you're like, oh, I didn't want wizards and I didn't want elves and I don't want war. So I would say rewrite this, no elves, no wizards and no war. So these are like big sweeping changes if I wanted it to rewrite. I'm going to exit out for just a second so we can go take a look at the one that I had earlier. I have Celeste as a seasoned celestial matchmaker from the realm of stars, a realm where beings who control fate and destiny reside. I love this idea of a celestial matchmaker. I think that that's going to just be really funny. So she's assigned a task. She's got to find, she's got to pair her latest client, Prince um, Amaranth of the elven realm with a human girl, Lily, from a small town librarian from the realm of earth. Uh, I can't say his name, but I like it. Amaranth. How would you say it? Amaranth? Amaranth. Amaranth. Yeah. I did. I did research to make sure like it was free to use and it's definitely myth mythological and uh, like it means it never, never dies. So I was like, well, that works for an elf. So he's a rogue and charismatic elf indifferent towards his fate, treating this task as another whim of the celestial beings. I could totally see an elf not liking the idea that there's a matchmaker who's going to tell him who he's going to marry. <laughs> Um, Lily, on the other hand, is completely unaware of the other realms and is focused on her simple human life and love for books. So we immediately have a lot of opportunity for conflict here. This is the kind of stuff that I'm looking for as a senior writing partner. The first draft that the AI gave me, um, I had, I had told it, you know, change this, change that, make this better. So that's how I got it to this, to this level here. But, um, and what I did with that is like, I specifically prompt I want lots of conflict. I want these to be lovers from two different worlds, those kinds of things. So the kind of language that you would actually hear a literary agent talk about of like, I'm looking for books that do blah, blah, blah. Um, who can remember when bullying was super hot in romance? Yeah, um, I didn't really love that trend necessarily. I was bullied a lot as a kid. I don't think that that's very romantic but never yuck, someone's young. So other people really liked bullying and it was really hot. Who remembers when vampires were super hot? <laughs> now vampires are kind of not super hot, right? So these are the kinds of um, tropes and things like that that you can bring to the AI to make sure that you're getting what you want out of your synopsis. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and grab this synopsis here because we're going to keep this. Doop. And I'm going to click over to my story engine so I can come back over here. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to select all of this and delete it. And I'm just pressing um, control V or command V on my keyboard so I could paste it in. Um, and we don't need the heavenly match. I don't need these questions at the back, at the bottom. 
Now, what I pasted in does not count against my word quota. So this is another opportunity that if you have very strong opinions about what's gonna happen in your book, um, it might be best for you to type your synopsis and get very specific with it. You do not have to have the AI generate any of these boxes for you for Story Engine. You can use Story Engine just for the boxes that you need help on. So now that I have this synopsis here, I'm gonna go ahead and click the button and generate my, my, my characters from this. Now, Story Engine is gonna do a very similar thing to the exercise I talked about before I turned this, the camera on. So before camera, I turned the camera on, I showed you all in chat GPT how I said, read this. Actually, I went to the outline first and then I like to generate my characters from my outline. Um, and I said, read this outline and generate all these characters that I need for this. Um, so I'm gonna bring those characters in, uh, but I just wanted to show you how it will read your synopsis and it will try to give you a list of all of the characters that you need. Um, for to write your story. So we have Celeste, we have Prince Amaranth, and we have Lily. Now let's talk about this for just a second. If my synopsis didn't use names, guess what? It would make it more difficult for the character list to make names that I like. So if you have strong opinions about your character names, please put your character names in your synopsis. Oh, we got some new people that I wasn't planning on. Lord Vesper. So this is actually cool because here it actually says a high ranking member of the celestial court. When I was doing this by hand, one of the problems I had is I ran the character list and it just said the celestial council. And I was like, please make that more specific, expand that out. And so I got four names of Orion, Cassiopeia, and I can't remember the third one, but um, it, it actually expanded it out and was more specific. And I would say specifics are the name of the game when you're working with Story Engine. So you can see here, it gave me um, an elf to be a friend for Prince Amaranth, and it gave me a friend for Lily. So it gave me seven characters, fantastic characters. I don't, I'm not unhappy with these characters, but for the sake of showing just difference here, um, I'm going to go ahead and bring in the characters that I generated. Oh, I made a whole separate document for them um, because this is, I've got a little bit more, more to work with here and I'll show you the difference. So on the story engine, the original one, I think they gave me seven characters. Now, those of us who write books for a living, seven characters is kind of, it's kind of a slim amount of characters for a, novel, a novella or a novel, right? Right. Yep. So I'm going to delete that. And I'm going to bring in the other list of characters that I had right here, Celeste and Prince Amaranth. Now I'm going to check my question mark here. And if you write your own characters, all you need is character name colon description. So that's what I have here. Celeste, colon, her explanation. Prince Amaranth, colon. And you'll notice I'm using more of my words because you have up to 700 words and characters. So you can actually kind of really beef up those, those descriptions here. Um, for my list of characters, I make sure that I have what they, what they are, who they are. And then I also have their motivation for the story. Um, if if uh, how characters look to you is important, if you're one of those right, if you're a writer who who does physical descriptions and things, I will confess that I'm one of those writers that I'm really skimpy on that. Um, you want to make sure you have those details in here so that Story Engine has the ability to keep that uh, keep that narrative logic for you. Um, so I have here actually Celeste, Prince Amaranth, Lily, the Celestial Councils defined then the members of the council, Orion, Cassiopeia, and Polaris. Then I have a suspicious celestial being with, named Seraph. Um, and I liked this, that uh, Seraph was just about wanting to adhere strictly to the law. So not necessarily evil, but just we go by the book. I bound. <laughs> yes. And then we have Miss Clara, the frequent visitor to Lily's library, Benjamin, his neighbor, and he owns a bakery. So great. Mayor Thompson. And then Elven Folk, we have... I, I don't speak Elvish. Um, Owland, I think, a wise. Go ahead, Leland. Do I have some duplicate names here? Yolanda. No, I, I was going to say that your suspicious being has a colon and then a name and a colon. Is that right? Or is it supposed to be? Yeah, it is. It is. Uh, so this is the being that turns Celeste in, named Seraph. 
because it was it was in the outline. So I'll have to look at the outline and see if, if it just says Sarah or if it changed it. But good catch. OK. Yeah, that was one of the things that I had to fix about this. So I'll come back to that. So the next thing that I can do is I can ask it to go ahead and generate me an outline. You can bring your own outline to the party, which is what I'm about to do. So here on the outline, we have act one introduction, chapter one, chapter two, chapter three. So it shows you what format you need to have it in. Um, and I'm looking here, is the character section for all even minor ones in a single scene or just major characters? Um, characters is for everything. So that's actually a really good question, um, MCD. So the question is, is the character section for all even minor ones in a single scene or just main characters? It is for all characters. All Any characters that you want to have recurring throughout the book who are referenced in the outline, what happens is, is that story engine reads the outline and goes, oh, the mayor's going to make a decree. Let me go check that character list and see if there's a mayor there. Oh, there is a mayor here. Now I know how to write the mayor. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So it's important that as you write your story, this is another advanced, like you need to know this. As you're writing your story, there is work for the human, for the senior writing partner. It is your job to make sure as you're writing the story, um, if details change, if the story logic starts to change and all of a sudden the mayor is going to not be this, I don't know what they described him as, a genial man who appreciates Lily's contribution. If I get to chapter three and the, the mayor comes in the library and he's a jerk, I need to, like, I, I change it to where he's a jerk. I need to update my character list because if I don't, if I start having different things all over the place, that's when you're going to get frustrated because you're going to find yourself um, writing a story engine. And you're going to be frustrated that it didn't pick up on the details. And that's because as we start writing chapters, and you'll see this, each chapter is a silo. The chapters don't know each other. They don't know the other one exists. The only documents that are going to control your, your story narrative is the character list and your outline. So everything has to go back to that outline, back to the character list. Elizabeth, so let me go ahead and generate the outline just to see while we're, while we're chatting. Go ahead, Ed. Um, would it help to, if there's going to be a major, say for your uh, protagonist, it's going to be, a, of course, a character arc. Would you put that in the description in the uh, characters or would you just do it so will it just show up somehow or i'm just wondering right. how character i'm just wondering how character arc fits into that section that says characters that's a great question so the best way to do it the way i do it because i use a spreadsheet i will have this list right here and this is my list of characters act one i will go through this list and i will read my outline and i will make changes to this description mm -hmm. to define what the characters are like at the end of act one starting act two Okay. Or if there's a different point in my outline, like let's say there's a chapter where a character is really going to change, um, and maybe that's an act one, then I, I note for myself as the senior writing partner, the one orchestrating all this, where I need to update that character's description before I run that chapter. So gotcha. I actually use my character descriptions as a way to manage my character's story arc. Gotcha. Makes sense. I don't leave it up to the AI to interpret how my character is going to change because it's going to let me down most of the time. So let me, uh, I didn't teach this backwards tonight. Usually mm -hmm. I started teaching this backwards because it made more sense for people. When we generate mm -hmm. chapters, we generate them one at a time. It's not going to generate all the chapters at once. So you have full control mm -hmm. over what information goes into a chapter silo before that chapter runs. Does that help answer that question? So to make sure I understand when uh, you come to a, a chapter further down, you go back in, change the characters as to how you want them to be. Yep. And the and when it goes to uh, uh, write the prose, it takes that into consideration for that chapter. Yeah, we're going to we're going to do that tonight. I'm going to mm -hmm. I'm hoping to make time to do that tonight. So, yes, okay. I will show you exactly how I make changes. OK. Um, one change I meant to make to Lily's characterization, and thank you, if I mispronounce your name, I apologize. Is it Hamid? Is that how you say it? Armid, H is Ar silent. Okay, Armid. Um, so Lily loves literature. How many of you would love that she often like quotes from literature when she talks? Does that okay. sound good for a librarian? Like, um, not when nervous, when I'm <laughs> she quotes from famous literature. 
I think that's excellent. <laughs> yes. So this is where I'm bringing me to the party and I'm not letting the, like the AI didn't come up with that. It's not that smart. <laughs> so this is where Story Engine uh, affords you the opportunity, the more you bring in, the more details that you bring in. I actually had the idea of just quotes from uh, Midsummer Night's Dream since we're dealing with elves and matchmaking. I thought that would be hilarious, uh, but that's <laughs> that might be a little bit too specific. If so it's we'll a real it. librarian, it'll, she'll give the Dewey Decimal. Yeah, exactly. Location. I was a librarian for years, so. Oh, good to know, Peggy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So our outline finished, and you'll notice that the, the outline wrote something really well. Um, I actually like a piece right here that is, um, so this one it did, she was just a, a successful matchmaker between a selkie prince and a human artist. Um, and it decided to go straight to her assignment. But this is kind of confusing because I don't, I don't like this chapter one. And this is where you have to be a senior writing, you have to be the senior writing partner. Celeste, the best celestial matchmaker in the realm of the stars, is seen finishing a successful match between a selkie prince and a human artist. Meanwhile, in the earth realm, Lily, a small town librarian, is seen going about her daily routine, immersed in her love for books and longing for the romance she reads about. In the elven realm, Prince Amaranth is introduced as a charming roguish elf, feeling the weight of his royal status and burdened by the expectations that come with it. This is a problem that uh, we're working on in the background here, because how many of you would say like that works great for a movie to show all three characters? Yeah. yeah. How many of you would put that in the first chapter of a book? No, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. That's all an information right. dump. <laughs> yeah, you might be able to pull off two and then like they collide at the end of that chapter or something like that. But that's when I read something like that, I'm like, okay, the AI has never written a book and it doesn't know that you can't do this. This is a bad idea. Mm -hmm. so, um, again, you're going to want to go through this chapter and you're going to want to validate it. If you skip this step and go on to the next one, you're going to be frustrated because the way that the AI thinks about outlines and the way the AI thinks that it can be written, it's not an actual writer itself. So it's, it's going to, it, it's the junior writing partner. Um, you'll notice that sometimes these will end up repeating themselves. Um, so that's why it's important that you go through the outline and you validate each step. I'm gonna go grab the outline that I already have because I, I read through it and beefed it up with the, um, the character list and everything like that. My, my, my outline is a little bit longer and we'll go through the story really fast. So I'm gonna go to story engine. I'm going to grab all of this and take it out. Now let's say I took it out and, oh no, I didn't actually mean to do that. I, I didn't want to. Story engine can save your bacon. In the top, see where the, um, See where the little clock symbol is, where it says history? If I click that button, it has it saved everything that was there. So I just click restore and that outline is right back again. I also can click the little uh, documents here and copy it if I wanna paste it out. And I think down at the bottom, okay, nope, there's not. Okay, um, <laughs> I think you'll be able to send it to a document here. But for the my just copy here. If you copy here, you can you can press the X button and you can paste it out into Sudorite proper if you wanted to save your outlines. So you might end up wanting to run the outline two or three times and kit bash them together. That might be what you want to do. It's up to you, however you want to do it. So the history uh, stays with the project even if it's six or six months or a year later. Is that right? Yes. So. Uh, yes. So the little history is there. Um, now it won't work on the chapter silos if you delete the chapter silo, but we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. But as far as outline into the left, you don't really ever delete these boxes completely. So it's always there as a history. Okay. Yep. But I am going to delete all that. So I can go ahead and paste in what I wanted. So to bring my own outline to the party, you have to have act one with a dash, and then you have to title that act. Now it doesn't have to say introduction. It could say Lollapalooza. I don't know. <laughs> you can say whatever you want there as long as it has a title and it puts a colon. So this one, the story begins in the celestial realm of the stars where the esteemed matchmaker Celeste receives a new assignment from the celestial council represented by the wise Orion, compassionate Cassiopeia and strict Polaris. Her task is to ensure the union between Prince Amaranth, 
of the elven realm and Lily, a librarian from Earth. Intrigued yet daunted by the challenge, Celeste sets out to meet them. Now, how many think that's a much better first chapter? Yes. Yeah, for a book, this is pretty cool. Mm -hmm. So I wanna write chapter one. So what I'm going to do is I'm already, oh, go ahead, Ryan. Do you mind explaining why that's a better chapter? I actually don't know, I haven't really. Oh, sure. So the reason why this is a better chapter is because it's one setting, number one. So when your readers first come into a book, it's very hard to get readers to be willing to jump with you in the first chapter to multiple settings. There are genres out there that do that. Thriller, political thriller sometimes, like if a reader goes in expecting that, um, you can get away with that. But in the romance genre, if I pick up a book and that author has me go to two or three different settings in chapter one, I'm going, this is an amateur and I'm putting it down. The other thing that this is doing too is that it's immediately setting up the story problem right away. She has her authority over her and telling her what the problem is. So we still could give an ex a little bit of a glimpse as to who Prince Amaranth is and to who Lily is without having to go jump to their everyday lives. Janine, go ahead. Is uh, act one, do you always put act one dash introduction and then you can, chapters? You can put you act, act one, one dash and any word you want. Okay, what, what's the, what's the uh, advantage of putting different words, introduction versus it has know, something to have else? A word. It has to have a word there. If you're, so this might actually be a serial in my case. If it was a serial, I might not call act one introduction. I might call it act one um, second war or something like that. Like if I was writing a serial. Okay, so, so you'd be act one, you know, we, can you put act one action opening? Like yeah. you want to open with action. Yeah. So, so the, the word here is for you, the human, the AI just says oh. there has to have a, there, the AI just says there has to be a word there. It doesn't guide the outline. in. Yeah. So if you go to the question mark here, it'll show you that you have to have a title for each act. So again, it could be um, any title that you want. You just have to have a word there. Okay. It's, it's so that Thank the you. dash and the out. It's so that the dash and the colon are right next to each other. Okay. Yep. Okay. So uh, we're going to go here. Um, what did everyone else think about this? I'm, I mean, I don't want to be like I'm the best writer. What did the rest, the rest of you think? Like, do you agree that this is a better chapter one because it's one setting and it's it's kind of uh, defining the story problem right away? Yes. I'm fine with it. Yep. I also like it because it focuses on one character and I always get confused when too many characters get introduced at the same time and I don't know. Exactly. <laughs> that's that's why. So it, it's one of those things about literature with the rules. You can break the rules once you understand them. Does that mean that there's not any great books out there that have three settings in the first chapter? No, there are some great ones out there. It's just the rule is don't do it because it can be very difficult to do it well. It's very easy to confuse the reader. Let me answer some questions from the chat real fast. Does the outline need to be in the three act structure or can the hero's journey or a custom structure work? You can use whatever structure you want as long as you have acts with some numbers and then some words after those numbers. So if you wanna do a five act structure, which is the hero's journey, you could. If you wanted to do a four act structure, um, if you wanted to do a 10 act structure, you can do whatever uh, you want to, the formatting. So you'll notice with mine, I actually have a six act structure um, here. So it's almost like a freight tag. Uh, where you have the the beginning, the introduction, the con the introduction, the conflict, the rising action, um, the climax, the conclusion. Okay, Tom, uh, Thomas asks, if a character has a specific want or dilemma, is chapter where we want to add that command? Um, no, so it depends. And sorry for that, and I'll explain. Mystery writers have found that if there's a specific like secret, and you know it, save it. Don't put it in the character list, like keep it, keep it to the side until you get to that chapter where you want it revealed. Otherwise you may run into the situation where the AI knows the secret. And so it becomes this problem because it keeps wanting to tell the secret um, even though there's instructions <laughs> not to. Is that true, Peggy? Yes, it <laughs> yes. <collabs. laughs> So for example, let's say, let's pretend <clears throat> in truth, Prince Amaranth has no desire whatsoever to marry Lily. He's bent on starting a war between the elves and the humans. If that's going to be my surprise at the end of the book, so everyone's like, oh no. And that leads to book two and Celeste and Lily have a relationship. I don't want to put that in there 
I would probably say like he's suspicious of humans and he doesn't really believe in this matchmaking. I wouldn't put that detail in until I get to that chapter to do that. Yeah. Well, you can put spoilers in for the AI. It just, if there's no guarantee that the AI won't spill the beans on the spoilers. So I would say only put that information in if you want it to influence where you, when you want it to influence it. If you don't want it in chapter one, like I would not want that in chapter one, I'm going to leave that out. I'm going to keep that in my notes. Well, well say to. you wanted to uh, break up the chapter into parts on your own. Is there any certain uh, structure you have to use or you would just go down and at a certain point you'd uh, go to the next line and put part one, then down to part two, part three, and then on to chapter two or. So if I want, if I want to take this chapter one and I want to break it into three. Yes. I need to renumber my chapters in my outline. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah, it's important. The The word act and chapter here, those are like magical words to pseudo write. Yeah. Gotcha. So if you, um, now you could put the words, you know, part one, part two, part three in there if you wanted, but you won't get separate silos for them. Mm -mm. That will just be kind of how pseudo write, it'll still be mashing them together because it's looking for this magic word chapter to delineate what will what is eligible to become a silo sure. yeah um so there's another quick question about uh scene breaks scene breaks you would just uh, i'll get to that in just a second cc basically you would just manually handle that in your chapter in the pros um so that's going to make more sense in just one second we have another question about the outline oh good question real fast about a silo a silo is this column right here so a chapter column or silo we're still working on the terminology um, so Janine, um, how do you get the outline to generate the structure you want, such as a three act structure, or do you have to structure it yourself with the info it gives you? You don't have to structure it at all. When you click this generate button, um, it, let me go to my history real fast. So you can see the, the previous one, the previous one, um, down here. Yeah. This one, it, it automatically did a, uh, four act conclusion for me. So it was working on building that. So that was the automatic. That's what's built in. If you want a custom, like if you have opinions about how many acts your book is going to be, you would just do it manually with the outline. You could manually add to it or, or something like that. All right. So let's get started with chapter one. So here's what's going to happen. This is when I talked a little bit about that interstitial step. So uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, whichever way you want to look at it, I look at it fortunately. AI is not very good at reading this paragraph and writing a whole chapter. How many of you have found that when you've played with AI? If you give it a paragraph and say, write this whole chapter, it kind of falls down, doesn't it? Yes. Yeah. It, 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 it decides writes you a very dumb chapter. <laughs> it writes you a very dumb chapter. All right. So how do we do it as humans? Well, um, <clears throat> I brainstormed and was thinking, and there was groups of us that were doing this and pseudo-write as well. What kind of instructions would you give a junior writing partner? Like what kind of instructions would you give a writing room? So you could give them a paragraph, but if they were very junior writers, wouldn't you like write them out step-by-step -step instructions of what has to happen in the chapter? Mm -hmm. I would. Okay, so what I'm going to do is that the AI is going, pseudo write is gonna read this chapter or this paragraph right here, the story begins. But it's not just gonna read that. Let's look at the question mark here. This is going to look at what's in brain dump, what's in genre, what's in style, what's in synopsis, what's in characters and what's an outline. And it's going to come up with a set of step-by-step -step instructions that we would give a junior writing partner to write this chapter. So that also means that it's important that those different sections are in congruence with each other. So this could be a source of, of um, frustration for you. If you've ever played with the beats, have you ever noticed that something wasn't quite right? It was starting to do some stuff that you that was not in the outline. Chances are something in your brain dump or your synopsis that you changed or you left there and then you made a change in the outline, you didn't go back and fix it in your brain dump or your, um, your synopsis. So I'm going to go ahead and click this generate button and here's what it's going to do. It's going to write those steps for me. Okay. Now this, this is the new part. This is the new part of writing with AI. This is a new skill. So if this is a little bit challenging at first, 
I want to tell you that you are among friends. You are in a safe place because this is hard for all of us. This is the new thing that all of us have been doing over the last couple of months, trying to figure out what it means to be a human who writes with AI. We have a question while this is developing. Um, MLD asks, uh, when writing more than one character point of view per chapter, any suggestions on prompting that? I see the questions from time to time in the Slack community. So the best idea for that is, um, I would break those chapters into individual chapters is the easiest way. So then you can change your style each time. But if you really, really must, and what I what I mean by that is I would re, re outline my, my outline. I would renumber it so that every point of view had its own chapter. That's the easiest way to handle it because every time in between, you'll notice in my style, I don't say what point of view it is. So here I would say, let's let's do first person point of view, Celeste. Let's do that. I don't actually ever write first person point of view. I'm just letting you know. Um, but for this, you could you could pretend to do so. Um, if you wanted the next chapter to be from Amarant's point of view, then I would change the style box. But I would make sure my outline, sorry about that, I didn't mean to move that. I would make sure that my outline made sense. Actually, it doesn't make sense to be from Amarant's point of view because in this chapter, we have it right here. So I guess it does for the later part. <laughs> Nope, it is still Celeste because she goes to Celeste and talks to him. So she's going to both in the first one. How about tense? What's the default? And do you list what tense you want? Same thing. Uh, tense, first person point of view, past tense. If you change or add things to the character outline sections after generating chapter one, will it take the updated information in chapter two? Yes. That's why you would make those changes. Okay. So let me, let me. This is the part where I get lots of questions and it sometimes makes it hard to follow what I'm teaching. So I'm gonna hold the questions for now. You can go ahead and add them, but I'll, I'll come back to them after I finish this section. So let's look at these beats that it came up with. Introduce the celestial realm of the stars, describing its unique features and setting the scene for the story. So this is what the AI came up with. If I have particular opinions about what this realm of stars looks like, I would put that in here. So I would change this to go introduce the celestial realm of stars where everything glitters, <laughs> uh, describing its unique features, uh, such as uh, what would be a cool thing for the realm of the stars. Um, no one ever sneezes because there's Maybe. no pollen. Maybe a pantheon in the stars of some kind. Oh, sure. And setting the scene for the story. Uh, as... The building for the um, Celestial Council looks like a pantheon made of stardust. Does that sound good, Ryan? Yeah? <laughs> okay, yeah, we're good. We're good. <laughs> Um, driver, establish the setting and atmosphere of the story. This is uh, something that comes from the prompting on the back end. If I don't like it, and I personally don't for this particular application, I don't, I don't need this line here. Driver, establish the setting and atmosphere of the story. But it gives you an example of what you could do. Um, so I'm going to actually, uh, yeah, we'll leave that there. Now, the next beat is introduce Celeste, the esteemed matchmaker, describing her role in the celestial realm and her reputation as a skilled matchmaker. Driver, introduce the protagonist and establish her expert expertise. Um, there was something about like she had just she had just like matched a sulky prince. So I'm gonna say like this: have someone in the realm of stars congratulate her on her recent matchmaking for the difficult, I'm gonna make it the king, the sulky king, you know, cause we're gonna have a prince for the elves. We can't have two princes, that's too many princes. So we'll do the sulky king. Um, this should be dialogue, but people in the realm of stars, <laughs> mostly speak in metaphor, but not Celeste. So you'll see I'm, I'm coming up with stuff to put in here to, to make this more me, to make it more like the story I want to read. 
Um, now, what Story Engine is going to do is it's going to do what's called a stride. So it's actually going to write one and two together. It's going to write three and four together. So this is helpful to know so that you can kind of look at them and make sure that they make sense. And you also, you don't have to, but it is a better practice. If there's action in two that impacts action in three, you kind of want to make that clear um, so that the AI knows what to do because otherwise it can sometimes repeat. So for example, it might start putting in two that she's going to walk to the celestial council building and then in three she she walks to the building again so one of the ways that you can combat against that and not rely on the ai to do that heavy lifting is i'm going to say celeste walks to the um celestial council building and we know that what that looks like because it looks like the pantheon made of stardust that's in the first one so she knows that um once inside the celestial council building. So you see how I'm, I'm, I'm leaving these breadcrumbs. I'm going through this and I'm changing it so that um, it, it, it's flowing in a way that the junior writing partner knows that uh, she's already in the building for, for, for part three. So it's not gonna write that over again. Has anyone seen repeating when they've run their beats? Yeah. Did you do this step of where you went through to make sure? Yep. Does it make it better sometimes, Teresa? Yes, it, it, it does. And also I go through the whole thing and look for like where people are mm -hmm. so that I don't lose characters that are supposed to maybe be in the conversation and, and like they're, they're still in the conversation, say in part three. And if you don't tell them that that character is still there and still in the conversation, sometimes they, they get lost between, especially between the blank, like, like they'll keep it in one and two, they'll right. keep it in three and four, but from, but not two, from two to three, three. right. Yeah. Which makes sense because that's, that's how it, that's it's, the gap. It, right. Right. So yeah, we have a mind the gap situation. And that's just what we mean when we say mind the gap or whatever. It's because of those strides. It just helps the AI out. That's all. You're just, you're just helping that little junior writing partner. So I have once inside the Celestial Council building, introduce the Celestial Council represented by the wise Orion, compassionate Cassiopeia and strict Polaris describing their roles and personalities. They sit upon floating clouds and the room is very echoing. Um, let's have at this. Cassiopeia disagrees with giving Celeste another difficult assignment, okay? So now I'm hearkening back to what I already talked about in number two, she just came from a difficult assignment. Now, before I do this, I'm gonna come back over to my characters to make sure I'm not contradicting anything. Um, she emphasizes with Kat, Kat Celeste's dilemma, supports her advocating for the power of love, so Polaris is strict and stern. So, um, so then I'm going to have him be the one that, that basically says, no, it's, it, we can't change the order of the assignments. That's against the rules. Does that make sense? That I went back to the characterization to make sure what I'm putting in the plot doesn't contradict. Does that make sense to everybody? Mm -hmm. Yep. Because remember the character list and that doc in that outline document, those are like the lifeblood documents of this whole thing. Um, so Cassiopeia, different assignment, Polaris disagrees. The rules are clear. This is dialogue. Remember, they speak in metaphor. <laughs> okay, I think oh, we'll do four too. I'm not gonna validate all of these commands because we would be here until tomorrow morning. Um, so describe the new assignment given to Celeste by the Celestial Council in detail, including the specific task of ensuring the union. Um, and I'm going to take this out here. Have Celeste be, um, uh, what is it? Comic relief. But Orion reminds her that if she ever wants a spot on the council, she needs to be more um, serious 
about her duty as a matchmaker. So I just raised the stakes a little bit. This is me being the senior writing partner, right? How many of you agree that if she is getting these assignments and stuff, you'd want to kind of present this like bigger world view here that Celeste is like maybe aspiring to be a member on the council? Yes, no? She's trying to earn her wings. Yes, she's trying to earn her, her way up. Yes. Yeah. Um, now, there's no limit to what you can do here. You could, I could literally write here, I could say, um, let's see the assignment. Uh, describe the assignment. Let's do this. Let's let's be really funny, crazy here. The assignment. <laughs> oh my goodness! Is delivered in poem form <laughs> by the council. <laughs> Seriously, you can play with this. You can ask it to do different things. You can say, "Hey, I need you to write a song for this beat. I need you to do this. I need you to do that." This should be a, a bunch of text messages that fly between characters. You can give instructions along with the beats. Um, so I'm ready to click generate, but I don't click generate up here. Uh, you need to come down here to the bottom for the pros. Now, I know for the example here, I stopped at four. Please don't stop at four. Please keep going on your own work. Please do, please make sure you go through and understand that there's another gap here between four and five. So I would, re I would read five and six. I would look critically at where what's going on in four and make sure it seamlessly uh, rolls over to five. The AI can do some of that, but the more you can help it, the better result you're gonna have. All right, so let's talk about our options. So we have a drop down here and everywhere in pseudo right, you see this little arrow, you, it means you have options. So we have most accurate, which is a little slower though. We have best pros, which is faster. And then we have fastest, you might get dizzy. Um, all of these have very different skills. We'll go ahead and play with um, let's go ahead and do the most accurate because that's going to take the longest. Um, it's the slowest. It should just be renamed the slowest. <laughs> um, it's not bad. It is very, very accurate. For me personally, with my writing ability, like my writing style, I find that I have to do more editing on the most accurate than I do on the best prose. And that's just because the most accurate it really is really accurate. <laughs> I mean, like right on the nose, you'll see here, here in this haven of stardust and dreams, no one ever sneezed, pollen simply didn't exist. It's not exactly how I intended for that to be interpreted in the text. <laughs> oh, look, it is talking in metaphor. The sun and moon now dance within the sulky king's eyes, thanks to your touch. <laughs> Yay! Oh, and it decided to make it seraph. Remember, it goes back to that character list. It can look at that character list and go, oh, let me have let me have this person. So that's a really good way to introduce that antagonist right from the very beginning. I smiled at the celestial being who had spoken. Their form is fluid and radiant as the realm itself. That's kind of you to say, Seraph, but it's my job after all, I replied, keeping my tone grounded and humble. Um, mm -hmm. yet, you, yet you create harmony where discord once reigned, they persisted. Interesting. So it made the decision that Seraph is non-binary. I like it. A symphony now sings where silence once echoed. Oh, that would be tedious for me too if I lived in the, the realm of stars and everyone talked to me like that. Thank you, I said simply, knowing there was no point in trying to match their poetic language. I was Celeste, the esteemed matchmaker of the celestial realm, known for my skill in pairing souls across worlds and dimensions. My role was vital, for only through true love could balance be maintained among the realms. As I walked toward the Celestial Council building, I couldn't help but let my thoughts drift back to my most recent success, the difficult Selkie King who had eluded love for centuries. It had taken every ounce of my expertise to find his perfect match, but the satisfaction of a job well done spurred me onto my next assignment. Real fast, senior writer writing here, an edit I would make there is I would make it more specific of, like I would make it funny of who his love match was, you know, somebody who eluded love for that long. All right, what would they have for me this time? My heart raced. Now you'll notice that because we put in the command, I'm sorry, the beats, she goes to the building, she goes into the building. This, this is a better transition than I've seen happen if you don't take that time to do that between those beats. Um, it, won't, it won't be necessarily a smooth transition. Okay. The so weaver of fates, has, fates have graced us with her presence. Indeed. 
The stars have whispered tales of your recent triumph, dear matchmaker, yet we wonder if you should rest before taking on another challenge. Oh, I love Cassiopeia. Rest, Polaris scoffed, his expression stern. The rivers of destiny wait not for any soul, and the ever-spinning wheel cares not for respite. Our rules are clear. I don't like Polaris. Anyone else not like Polaris? <laughs> <laughs> I think Polaris keeps everything on track. He's <laughs> Rules that bind like ivy, choking the growth of love, I quipped, attempting to lighten the conversation. I love it. And it even had the character try to talk in metaphor. <laughs> love may bloom from adversity, Celeste, Orion said, his voice firm but fair. If you seek a place among us, you must remember the gravity of your duty. Very well, I conceded. I am ready to receive my next assignment. Oh my goodness, it did do it in a poem <laughs> remember when i said the assignment gets delivered as a poem yeah. here you go <laughs> <laughs> an elven prince of regal birth with eyes that hold celestial mirth shall find his heart's desire entwined with mortal dreams and earthly rhymes from realm of man a simple maid in the quiet halls of books displayed for her heart doth long for tale so grand to live the love her stories plan this is incredible. The artificial intelligence picked up from the characterization what should go in the poem. The only instructions I gave it was that the assignment had to be delivered in a poem. It decided what would go in that poem, which is great because I'm not a poet. <laughs> Elizabeth, you may be creating a new subgenre. Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> with with met metaphor and poem. And That's everything. not a bad poem. <laughs> Pretty no, remarkable. <laughs> I feel like the whole speaking and metaphor plus poem is really strengthening this like atmosphere of the setting. Of the yes. Setting. yes, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, this, yeah. This is how you do it. <laughs> this is how you you take it to that next level, and you don't just have writing that that looks like uh, an AI wrote it. I'm going to go ahead and pause it because we got three through four. Oh no, it, it's just got to do all the way to five six. I missed the. Okay, so pause it before you get to the end of the stride. <laughs> I'm still learning on that. Um, the reason I'm doing that is because I was going to go ahead and do uh, do another chapter one. I know everyone's brain just went, wait, what? why Elizabeth? The One of the strengths, this is a very advanced tool tip here too. Hmm. One of the strengths of um, Story Engine is you can run the same chapter multiple times, which means you can you can become a story explorer with Story Engine. I know that's a lot of SEs. When you explore your story, what I mean by that is you could run the same chapter and the same beat from a different character's point of view. So you could run it from the villain's point of view. I could run this entire thing, those exact same beats from Seraph's point of view so that it would have Seraph like listening in and eavesdropping and everything like that. But do you have to do this for the entire story or can you? kind of segment this to like you have like say half the story written you want to start editing chapters is there a way to do that or are you just really kind of have there is um, one of the things that uh you can do what you need to do if you have an existing story that's halfway done because i'm doing this with my own with my own project is you need to put it and out like you need to make an outline for what you already have done in this format you mm -hmm. also need to have your list of characters and you need to have, you don't necessarily have to know the whole story, but you need to have an idea of what you want to have next so that the story knows what to do. Um, so what you could do is let, if you, you could take this outline really fast. I'm just gonna show this. I'm gonna come right back. Let me go to, I'm gonna open up a new document and this is where laser tools and why I love having laser tools in Sudorite. So I know a lot of people would take half of an outline and they would just take it straight to ChatGPT. But I say, you don't need to do that. You should do it in pseudo, right? And I'll show you why. So if I go outline, um, I'm just gonna do outline example. So I remember what it is. Here's what I like to do. So let's pretend this book was not finished. And I was like, right here with act five. I was stuck on act five. I was like, oh man, I don't know what's gonna happen in act five. My right settings. Bring my creativity all the way down. So it has to follow the prompt, 250 words, and I am greedy. So I'm gonna ask for four cards. And the reason I'm gonna do that is I'm gonna go ahead and click the right button. It's going to read up, this outline's only 469 words. So it's reading up that entire outline and it's going to propose what could come next in the story. So if you are a true pantser, but you're stuck, you could still use the laser tools to help you 
So here I have, and it, it'll keep the format, chapter 10, chapter 12, chapter 10, 11, 12. So it decided a heated debate, this one after a heated debate as well. And then this one, uh, after many deliberation, they finally come to a council. That's probably, uh, that's because in chapter nine, she confronts the council. So it makes sense that the next chapter was the council has to give a, give a response back. Then once you do that, you could put the, you could remember how I copied and pasted in. You can do the same thing. You don't have to let it generate. You can actually copy and paste what you want into those boxes. Great question. Janine, go right ahead. I was just wondering, does prose remember those different versions or, um, or I'm should about, you copy paste it? I'm about to show you how it does it. Okay. Yeah, good question. Perfect segue, thank you. <laughs> so remember when I talked about the silos not knowing about each other? That's a good thing um, and I'll show you why. So we already have a chapter one. I'm gonna click create chapter and I'm gonna get a second chapter one. Now this chapter one has no idea that the chapter one to the left of it exists. Um, what I'm going to do though, so because I'm gonna run this, I'm just gonna show you different models here. I'm gonna copy uh, my beats and I'm gonna bring them over here and I'm just gonna paste them in. So I didn't generate it. This didn't cost me another 500 words. I'm just copying and pasting the same beats in. And now, and this is an important little uh, tip, trip, uh, tip here. Before, while everyone was talking, I went ahead and typed in big letters here at the top, most accurate, because mm -hmm. you'll see that this is most accurate here. Watch what happens. As soon as I change this to best prose, it changes it over there too. So you can get confused. I know <laughs> it, it's good. It tries to help you always write in the same mode. But if you're trying to do like find out what mode works for you, you definitely want to mark it. Okay. Ryan says they're probably going to change that behavior. There you go. <laughs> In the meantime, that's what you want to do. Now, I'm not going to change the, the um, beats or anything like that for right now. I'm just going to click the button to generate the pros. And so now this is generate the best pros. And this way we can compare them side by side. I also like this one because it's so much faster. So the best pros, or I'm sorry, this was the most accurate. See, it's still messing with my head. The most accurate wrote 1,160 words for one and two and three and four. Oh, it actually wrote five and six as well. Hold on a minute here. That's cheating. <laughs> <laughs> we'll just take that out. <laughs> it's like, wait a minute. That felt like really short. Okay. So it wrote uh, 731 words and best prose wrote 671 words. So on that surface. I'm trying to make my screen a little bit bigger so you guys can see these side by side really well. On that realm, uh, on that thing, I think that they're both pretty equal. I mean, that's mm -hmm. that's within a 10% margin of error. That's within 60 to 70 words of each other. So it's not necessarily one is better than the other. I will say though that most accurate is more verbose in my experience. So let's, let's validate and let's see how it goes. Um, the celestial realm of stars glittered like an endless sea of diamonds, each twinkle a testament to the beauty that lay beyond mortal comprehension. Here in this heaven of stardust and dreams, no one ever sneezed. Pollen simply didn't exist. The air was fresh and light, <laughs> imbued with magic that tickled the senses. At the heart of this ethereal landscape stood the celestial council's building, a majestic pantheon sculpted from shimmering stardust. Um... It's not bad. It's just very on the nose. It's very like, very grand. I, I, I felt like I could hear like really uh, like an orchestral score <laughs> as I was reading that paragraph. Over here, <laughs> the stardust glittered under my sandals as I made my way through the celestial streets, the familiar sense of star jasmine and comet dust filling my senses. In the realm of the stars, no one ever sneezed. We had no such thing as pollen. That's a modern version. <laughs> huh? That sound, reads like a modern novel that's yes. opposed to a historical novel. Yes. So it depends on what your fantasy romance is. Are you more modern? Are you going for that more, you know, contemporary feel? Mm -hmm. uh, I think we did read a lot of the other one because I went through it when it came. So we'll just look at this that one here. Congratulations on the sulky match, Celeste, a passing star sprite waved, her light dimming with the effort of speech. Oh, <laughs> poor little star sprite. <laughs> 
<laughs> the sprites rarely talked, communicating through the brightness of their glow, but some still tried to mimic our verbal customs. Mm -hmm. I dipped my head in thanks, a flush heating my cheeks at the praise. My skills as a matchmaker were well known in our realm, though that brought its own troubles. The pantheon of the Celestial Council towered before me, stardust shifting and swirling into spires that reached up into the endless night sky. Time for my weekly check-in. Okay, I already like this girl in this that one. one. Like, I, <laughs> I, I want to be with her. <laughs> yeah. I straightened my gown of constellations and glided through the entrance, the familiar scent of ionized gases greeting me. The council sat on their thrones of clouds, wispy and ever-changing. Orion's nebula eyes gleamed with wisdom, Cassiopeia's star cluster crown glimmering with compassion. Polaris remained still and sharp as always, the North Star's light harsh. I don't love that. So that's where I might look at how they were described in the other one, because this is kind of weak to me. This is a little bit da 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 da. That's the very AI cadence. I would, I would edit that. The sulky match pleased us, Celeste, Orion intoned, his voice an echo in the vast chamber, but we have a new task for you. Um, I will notice that it's not really speaking in metaphor as much. Do you guys notice that? Yeah. Uh, a little bit. Oh, now that's some new stuff right here. My heart lurched at the mention of Amarant's name. We had history, a secret history, one that could never be if I wished to join the council. I swallowed hard, folding my hands to hide their trembling. Uh -huh. Beautiful. Interesting. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> now you see why I like best prose. <laughs> <clears throat> it will be done the words tasted of betrayal on my lips but i had a duty duty i always had a duty um it didn't deliver the assignment in a song though <laughs> it didn't do the poem <laughs> so this is why if you are someone who's like i i wasn't unhappy with this result this result made me happy believe it or not i was mm -hmm. i was really really like satisfied with this it did exactly what i told it to do the other one did not but i liked it like i liked reading yes. it so for me i often kit bash these together or right. i yes yes smash or i take pieces <laughs> and things like that so you've got the poem and you can just put it in there exactly yeah. and yep. if i know i want a poem i don't need the story engine to write it i could use yeah. um actually pseudo write has a poem feature <laughs> again <laughs> What? It does under more, or maybe it's gone now. I can't remember, but oh. you could, you could in guided, right. I could actually take this and this is where I like it. Um, if I, if I do copy here, actually the new button, the Elizabeth button down here at the bottom is a send to doc button. Oh, cool. So I'm going to send it to doc. Uh -huh. And there I have it. Now I'm going to actually rename this best prose and the reason for that is when i go back to my story engine i didn't get that could you try again no <laughs> i'm sorry i have too many ais and robots around me i know um, the original <laughs> chapter one let me go down to the send to doc and when i send that to doc you'll notice it calls that one chapter one too so that's why i rename if you have more than one chapter one mm -hmm. got it so Let's say you like the accuracy of most accurate, but you don't want to sit and watch it run all of that. And you, you really just don't feel like wanting to edit all that. You just know when you want a poem and you know when you don't want a poem. So okay. if I come to best prose and I just, those ideas I had at the, uh, uh, the beat section, because mm -hmm. I don't, I, I love this. Um, I can actually grab this <laughs> and I can say rewrite, <laughs> customize, be delivered as a poem go <laughs> now the downside of this is it's not going to get those those rich details of her being a librarian and all of that so that's where there's one kind of limitation on this oh. no no it did oh it? well because yeah. i already knew she was a librarian and oh okay here. okay mm -hmm. <laughs> you know i used the uh, chat gbt to write a poem and I thought, well, that would save me words. But like you just said, doing no. it in pseudo right, you're going to get the uh, everything brought into it that you had yes. set up before. Yeah. So let's let's look at. Uh, so we played with chapter one and chapter two. Uh, well, chapter mm -hmm. one. Let's come down here to. Um, let's go to chapter seven, okay? Because we have a new character, Seraph. 
suspecting an emotional involvement. Um, oh, that's a great idea. Ryan, I'm sorry, because this is this goes back to what we were talking about. You could set up a singleton chapter with just one beat and run most accurate on it. You could. Um, so if I just wanted that that poem part, I could just say that I want it. I could just put the three, four, it could make it one and two and just say I wanted to run that because I want the poem part. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. So Sarah, actually, that's a that's a new best practice, Ryan. So one of the ways that you can control, so my drop down here, you'll notice it stops at chapter 15, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Well, let's say I want a chapter just for that kind of that kind of use of what, what Ryan's talking about. So this is a new best practice, everyone. Make an extra chapter at the end that has nothing in it. <laughs> this is your wildcard chapter. That's what we'll call it. So as soon as I write chapter 16 with a colon and I don't put any information there, if I do my drop down, now I have a chapter 16. So I can create that chapter and I could literally grab these beats that I wanted. Cause remember I said, it's gonna get delivered as a poem. Mm -hmm. And once I put this in here, let's see if it's- And it'll write a new poem oh, every time. I would we think. didn't detect a corresponding entry in the outline. Okay. So that's a, I know where that error is coming from now. Okay. So I'm going to grab chapter one because you're going to need to bring in here again, whatever chapter is referencing your wild, like your, my wild card right now is going to do a wild card situation for, for chapter one. So I just put chapter one into under chapter 16 for just briefly so that it has some information there. And then I'm going to click most accurate and now it'll work. So if you see that error where it says there's no corresponding entry, it means your chapter can't be completely blank there. So if you're doing a wild card for chapter four, just copy and paste your chapter four into chapter 16. This is, does everyone understand what we're doing here? We're basically trying to make it rewrite just one little piece using most accurate without having to sit there for the two hours yeah. it takes most accurate to write because <laughs> most accurate is slow. It's gonna be interesting to compare the poems. It will be. All right, so we're good. Just pausing that to make sure that it's not, it's not gonna go go haywire and keep going. Now, I don't want this wildcard chapter anymore. Okay, but okay, I can't do it. So I gotta, hold on. I've gotta send this to doc. I just, I just can't throw good words away. It just, I just, it's, it's not, I just can't do it. <laughs> the best so writers I, always save their words in an out file. I know, I might use it later. <laughs> I've done it for years. All right. So let's say I'm done with a silo and I'm done, but I still, I mean, even I, I still get like anxiety about this. <laughs> I like it better one day when we can just archive these, uh, we'll but you're going to click. Huh? Okay. I'm sure we'll end up putting a trash can, but we have a running joke that every, everything in pseudo, right? Eventually gets a trash can. <laughs> but I mean, what does it feel like right now? It feels, it feels anxiety inducing, right? To delete it. Elizabeth, you're a word hoarder. Oh, you know what? I, oh, I'm no. fine with being a dragon. <laughs> so it's gone. That silo is gone. So don't delete them willy nilly. <laughs> so uh, the wild card silo is gone. Uh, let's go ahead and do chapter seven because that was from Sarah and we wanted to take a look at that. Yes, word hoarder. I, I prefer word dragon, but because word hoarder sounds like it could very quickly sound like something completely different than what you intended. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, then. Yeah, chapter seven. Seraph, suspecting an emotional involvement, reports Celeste's unconventional behavior to the Celestial Council. Outrage, the council orders Celeste to sever her connection with Lily and Amaranth, reminding her of her celestial laws she has apparently violated. Uh, okay, so I'm not going to actually change the point of view on that one because obviously... Celeste wouldn't know that Seraph is talking to the Celestial Council and it sounds like she's going to be there. So, um, so I'm actually going to change this a little bit. Reported. Okay. Outrage. The Council orders Celeste where her um, betrayer is revealed. Celeste is ordered to sever her connection. Okay, perfect. So do you guys see how I changed that? Because there was no way for me to omnisciently, because I don't have an omniscient narrator. 
So since we're writing in first person from Celeste's point of view, I had to change that outline. And actually that's a step I would have done with this outline, a layering technique I would have done in chat GPT-4. If I knew I was gonna be writing from first person, I would say, read this outline. Now make corrections to it so that it can be written in first person point of view from Celeste's point of view. Because obviously Celeste is not going to have forewarned knowledge that Seraph's gonna turn her in. Does that make sense? Got it. Yeah. So that's just a, being a senior, <laughs> senior writing partner. Um, so step seven. So uh, before I generate these, these beats, let's go back for just a second. Cause there was one thing that I wanted to show. Um, so it does say that she, she starts to love them. So how do we wanna show that her, her characterization has changed a little bit? So we have here that Celeste is committed, kind and thoughtful with a hidden longing for the love she orchestrates for others. So I don't think it's, it's not hidden anymore. So the way I'm gonna change this with a love for the two people she is supposed to match make. She, um, her moods shift wildly because one moment she's in love uh, and the next despair because she believes she has to give them up to keep with the strict laws of the realm. So there we go. So this is me altering the character for later in the story. Does this make sense to everyone? Mm -hmm. So before she just had a hidden longing, it's no longer hidden. So let's see how the characterization changes um, now that she's got this thing and that the, the council is gonna tell her, hey, you can't. Um, is everybody cool that I just let, um, no, so it's not later because now it's, we're at chapter seven where she's getting reported to the council for this love. Got it. So that's, but good catch, Janine. So that's why, so she, she's, she's here. Um, she kind of starts to fall in love with them. Then she starts distancing, hoping she can control her feelings. And then that attracts the, the Seraph who reports her to the council. And uh, so we're, we're trying to capture her characterization changing here. So here you'll notice that it only wrote me 10 beats this time. And that's another feature. You'll notice my other ones here, it was writing 12. It has the ability to decide how many beats it writes, right, Ryan, for, the, um, for what's there in the chapter? Sorry, I was answering another Slack message. Oh, no, that's okay. It, it's not always going to be 12, right? Like it, it'll do however many it thinks it needs to do. That's correct. I've had 11 and 14. Yeah, so, so it does try to decide. So Seraph, a detail-oriented member of the Celestial Council, observes Celeste spending an unusual amount of time with Lily and Namron, raising concerns. So this actually would have happened in the previous chapter, so I would need to change that, but I was already kind of wonky with the, chap with the, with the outline. Seraph reports Celeste's behavior to the council, citing specific examples. Um, I'm gonna change this. So we're gonna just take this out, go away. And honestly, the numbering doesn't matter because it's going to run, well, I'll, I'll change it so that it's clear for us. But I'm, I'll, I'll change them in a minute. Seraph report, uh, wishes to report on Celeste's behavior to the council. Oh my gosh. I'm gonna just take this out. Cause the scene, if it's, if it's Celeste's point of view, it would start with the council ordering her, you know? Celeste is wretched watching replays of her dreams about Amaranth and Lily, knowing she cannot risk being near either of them when she receives 
an edict to return back to the realm of stars immediately. All right, so now we're gonna be back in the Pantheon in the Celestial uh, Council building. Celeste is surprised to see Seraph standing there. The council orders Celeste to answer for the charges Now, this is an important part here. So I'm gonna paste in what we originally had where uh, he's going to cite specific things. However, and so this one's number four. Um, this is where you would have to keep narrative logic. I have not already written chapters two through five. So I don't know what the report is that Seraph has on her. There's two ways you can handle this. Number one, you could decide that um, these things happened off camera. And so it's, it's news to the reader as well, which would make sense for a first person point of view thing, because Celeste would not have been aware that Seraph was taking notes on her necessarily of her doing something wrong. Or you could, if you knew that there was already instances that happened that you want, like you had written where Seraph's, like there were signs to the reader that Seraph was there or something like that, then you would want to pull those specific details in. I don't have those specific details in, so I'm gonna allow it to just make this up and we're gonna act like this happened and, and Celeste wasn't aware. This is trying to reconcile the fact, this is why I don't write first person y'all, but this is a very advanced thing when you're dealing with AI. So Seraph wishes to, so, so Seraph reports. So now we have them all in the same room here on Celeste's mm -hmm. behavior to the council, um, but they cite uh, and they cite and they cite specific expressing concerns about the potential violation of social laws. Okay. Um, Celeste shows, let's see, physical and emotional cues indicating her state of mind. She reacts poorly <laughs> to the accusations, uh, but also more or less admits she is in love. It's tense. So they speak in metaphor and start arguing about the situation. Okay. So we don't want the betrayer's already been revealed. Um, so let's see here. Take that out. This council reminds Celeste of the social law she has violated and the consequences of noncompliance. Um, she defends herself, pleads her case. Um, so this is where you'd want to give specifics here about what are the consequences. This is very vague for the AI to handle, but we're just going to do one through four like we did before so that we can see how Celeste's characterization changes. Sounds good? Yeah. That was the point of this exercise. Um, everybody cool that I do best pros because it's speedy? Yes. All right. So we'll go with that. And this will be the end of this. And thank you guys so much for sticking it out for an hour and 45 minutes, but we covered a lot um in all of this i think we really did a deep dive and i'm hoping more you feel armed and ready to go use story engine for your own writing um that we really kind of demystified some of the how these things work <clears throat> Ooh. all right we'll press pause on that so it'll just finish up three and four okay so Celeste clutched at the silken covers of her bed, her knuckles white as she struggled against the tide of anguish rising within her. In her mind's eye, she replayed the last moments with Amaranth and Lily, their hands entwined and hearts bared under the light of a thousand stars. A sharp knock rattled her chamber door, startling her from the memories. Summons from the council, a disembodied voice intoned, you're to return to the realm of stars immediately. Celeste rose on trembling legs, her heart pounding. What could the council possibly want now after all this time? She hadn't dared return in ages, not since she'd chosen to... Okay, so this is a... Claw, uh, I'm sorry, the best pros invented this. So 
that's something I would change. When the doors to the social council became in view, a spike of panic shot through her. Seraph stood at the entrance, arms crossed and eyes gleaming with triumph. Of course he would be the one to turn her in. He'd always clung to the rules as tightly as a miser clutches gold. The council members were arranged in a semicircle, robed figures hovering inches off the ground. Celeste inclined her head. You summoned me? You stand accused of violating celestial law. What say you to these charges? Seraph smirked, clearly relishing his role as accuser. Celeste gritted her teeth, clutching. So um, part of this problem is that it's so vague that it's just, it's kind of being vague because I don't have specifics here. I did not take the time in those. You see the difference. When we took those times to add in those beats some specifics, it makes all the difference in the writing, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. It really does. This, to me, this feels like it's a, dis there's like a lot of distance to me as yeah. a reader. It says you broke the law, but it doesn't specifically say what the laws that she broke was. I feel no emotional no I, I feel nothing when I'm reading this unlike chapter one and the difference is is that I took the time to validate those beats and really dive deep here I'm looking at our class being almost over and uh um and I'm trying to speed speed it so if you want a you you get what you pay for in time Either yeah. you spend the time and you get the quality beats or you rush through it and you kind of get something that's like, well, yep, hey, yeah, I wrote that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So. Um, so it, it this is where you can have some problems and it's it's literally it's not the AI's fault, but if you if you find yourself frustrated like this, where it's it's um it's not keeping narrative logic it's not on it it's on me i didn't keep narrative logic i was making all kinds of changes and i really didn't take the time to validate it and so that's why i got this result but it's not a bad result i would be able to use a lot of this and i would be able to play with it just for giggles let's see what happens when we tell it to do most accurate so one thing about most accurate is that it should be more forgiving to uh the beats, beats. That were written haphazardly. So maybe that you might actually get better results with more accurate here since we kind of breezed through the beats refinement yeah. stage. After. This is a much better result already from those lackluster beats that I wrote. That's fine on me. I didn't beef them up and as a result, but this is this is great. I like this. More forgiving in what way for accurate? So for example, like, Sometimes is a challenge. I just intentionally give like really short input to see how lazy is a user can possibly be and still get good results. So like you could have a beat that's just like they fight. That's it. <laughs> and mo most accurate will probably come up with something blow by blow <laughs> passable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, compared to some of the other models, because it's it's a little it's a better thinker. So if there's missing information or conflicting information, it can think a little bit more about that and be like, yeah, it oh, can go find it in the brain dump in the in synopsis. The end, yeah, what can I pull out from the synopsis? Yeah, yeah exactly. So most accurate is the grown up in the room. Yeah, but sometimes <laughs> it writes very soullessly because it's just really, really accurate. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm going to click pause on this so it'll only write three through four. So it's kind of like the setting switch on uh, pseudo right, where mm -hmm. you take it all the way to the left. Yes, and no very creativity. much so. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, metaphor, metaphorical. It can start inventing all kinds of stuff. So if you want stuff to be invented, better prose. So pantsers are probably going to find better prose to be more what they're in line with because it's going to introduce new things into it, and people who are if you are really strict on your outline, you may end up running both because you want to see what it does and, and kit bash them together. Answers might also like, one, one thing that we didn't do, but you can try doing is if you generate your beats and just immediately hit fat go on fastest without editing the beats at all. And then if you chose fastest, you know, in, in just a couple minutes, you'll be able to read a first draft of that entire chapter and make a quick kind of go, no go decision on like, oh, this whole idea of this chapter is stupid. I'm going to scrap it and go try something else completely different. Yeah. 
Makes sense. Okay. That actually could be a best practice or it could be a strong practice for anybody. Even if you have a preference yeah. of the other models, seeing it run it in fastest can help you very quickly kind of validate if the story structure makes sense. So the way you can control how many words it writes is control how many beats it has. It's only going uh -huh. to write 100 to 200 words per beat. So if you give the fastest model 12 beats, that's when you're going to get that 2,400 words. If yeah, I didn't one, think of that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So think of beats mm -hmm. as also your control for word count. I know a lot of you have asked, like, how do I tell it to write a specific word count? Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, you have to do a little bit of math. Multiply your beats by 100 to 200, and that's going to give you the realm of where it's at. You'll see here, I ran four beats, one, two, three, four, and I'm right at 797 words, very close to 800. So that's 200 per, per, per beat. Um, so yeah, this, I would say most accurate would help with this for the, for this one, but, um, I do see that her, her characterization has changed. She's almost like broken when I, when I was validating some of this dialogue, much different than what she was in the first chapter where she was like willing to be strong for the council and everything. Now we have this, please, you must understand. I never intended for this to happen. They were just so perfect together. And even with me, I had an emotional reaction to this line here that I didn't have before Ugh. um and then she says please is there no room for love in our realm and this is this is Polaris you know it's Polaris love is a powerful force but it is not our place to indulge in it we must be impartial Celeste that is the burden we bear that's a total Polaris thing to say so but it, it decided that it was one of the council members conceded and I would I would change that to Polaris all right, so thank you so much, everyone, for coming to Story Engine 101 with an asterisk. <laughs> <laughs> I know this was a lot, but I have waited for this day for so long, it feels like, for months. And, and to see it finally come out and everything like that, I just, my face hurts from smiling. <laughs>